ora a Miriam Makamo. Who was the man who blew up the Greenpeace ship Rainbow Warrior? Well, he's a spy who's remained hidden for 30 years, the French secret agent who placed the explosives that killed Fernando Pereira. 30 years ago this month, the French government was still denying it was responsible for sinking the ship, even though two French secret agents had been arrested in Auckland. Then the French newspaper Le Monde broke the story that a team of French combat divers had also been in New Zealand. Tonight, for the first time, the man who led that dive team, the man who actually planted the bombs, has broken his silence to talk to Sunday. This from John Hudson. My role was to plant two bombs on the Rainbow Warrior. He led the dive team, he set the bombs. And for 30 years he remained hidden, guarding the secret of what really happened the night the Rainbow Warrior was sunk. For a member of a secret service, we never talk. But finally, he is talking. We were not cold-blooded killers. We did everything to preserve the life of the people on board of the Rainbow Warrior. From your point of view, was your part of the operation a success? No. Uh, for me, it was not successful. It was a, a big, big failure. July 1985. The Rainbow Warrior sails into Auckland's Waitemata Harbour, accompanied by a flotilla ready to join the Greenpeace ship at Muraroa Atoll to protest against French nuclear testing. We were preparing to go to French Polynesia where we were going to protest the nuclear testing of France. But the French government had other ideas. It sent 13 members of its secret service, the DGSE, to sink the Rainbow Warrior before it left Auckland. The French had always claimed that they didn't want to kill anybody. But in my opinion, either they were blatantly incompetent or they didn't want to kill anybody. They really didn't care, care if they did. Just before midnight on July the 10th, two bombs exploded. The first blew a two square meter hole in the engine room. The second smaller bomb was attached to the keel. It was the force of the second explosion that I'm sure trapped him in the room. Two days after the bombing, detectives acting on a tip-off arrested two French agents, Dominic Prieur and Alain Marfar, travelling on fake passports, posing as Swiss honeymooners. The Uvea, a charter yacht which brought the bombs to New Zealand, was searched in Norfolk Island and then released. At first, discarded equipment, the only clues to the agents who planted the bombs. So who were they? How did they get away? We know that the French government ordered the attack to be carried out by the French Secret Service. But what about the agent responsible for planting the bombs that sank the Rainbow Warrior? Well, here in northern France, Sunday has tracked him down. This is Metz, 3,000-year-old city in Lorraine province. It's now home to Colonel Jean-Luc Kister, a former head of the combat dive team of the French Secret Service. So you put both the bombs on the hull yourself and set them? Yes, yes. Uh, I was the team leader and uh, I had the responsibility uh, for this part of the operation. Colonel Kister remembers being surprised when told of the plan to stop the Rainbow Warrior. For us, uh, Greenpeace members were uh, engaged troublemakers, but not very dangerous. We were amazed that uh, such an operation can be conducted uh, on, uh, on there. But this was the time of the Cold War with the Soviets. We were told that uh, Greenpeace was infiltrated by the KGB. This was the explanation given to us. Jean-Luc Kister had become a military cadet at just 17. By 1985, he was a captain in the combat dive team, a highly trained professional soldier. So why was the decision taken to blow it up and sink it in Auckland Harbour? One option would have been to plant the bomb in Vanuatu or in Auckland and to delay the explosion uh, when the boat would be offshore. Uh, this was certainly the safest for the operators, but the more dangerous for the crew. 
and uh, it was immediately abandoned. Another option, to contaminate the ship's fuel with bacteria, was also abandoned. I don't know who decided to sink it, but it was clear that in Auckland this was certainly easier, and uh, the fact that the, the ship was docked was uh, less dangerous for uh, the crew because we thought also that due to the low tide, even if the boat was sunk, it will lay on the bottom, not totally submerged. It was decided that the explosion could occur around uh, midnight. It was thought that nobody would be in the engine room. Why two bombs? One bomb was uh, expected to make the people to evacuate the boat and the second to, to sink it. But Jean-Luc Kister has revealed that's not what happened. He placed the first larger bomb on the hull next to the engine room. It was decided by the chief of the operation to make the first one to explode in order that when the, there will be water in, inside the boat at that time, everybody will, uh, uh, will evacuate. But the ship sank much faster than they had expected. The second smaller bomb clamped on the keel was designed to keep people off the boat. But in fact, it killed a man. So how long was the delay between the two explosions? We trigger with a four minutes delay between the two bombs. Everything was done to prevent anybody to, to come back. Was four minutes really long enough, do you think, for people to evacuate? It was thought that it was enough time and we didn't expect the boat will sink so quickly. The plan was to sink the Rainbow Warrior while keeping the crew out of harm's way. But they got it wrong. One man paid for that mistake with his life. My dad has been murdered. After the break, 30 years on, an apology. I would like to take this opportunity to express my deepest regrets. We now know the French agents blew a hole in the Rainbow Warrior far larger than they had expected. Before the bombing, combat divers were watching their target. And we have seen that there was a sailing ship along the, the rainbow. They had been ordered to place the first larger bomb portside, but realized this would have endangered anyone on board the yachts alongside. I decided to put it on the starboard of the boat, always thinking not to hurt anybody. There were three agents on the Zodiac carrying two bombs to sink the ship. Jean-Luc Quista and Jean Camas, with the combat divers, Girard Royal, the boatman. The two combat divers slipped into the water and were towed under the inflatable and released 500 metres from their target. And we are linked together by a rope because we are operating in the darkness. Whereabouts on the boat did you set the bombs? On the hull. It was on the hull. Yeah. On board, a birthday party is underway. We were quite fortunate because the first bomb blew a two by two meter hole right in the side of the hull. I mean, the boat sank in 45 seconds. When you were planting the bombs, were you aware that there were people on board? No, 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 we didn't know anything on, on what was happening. And if there was some people on board, everything was done in order that they can evacuate. Wasn't there a real danger that the first blast could have killed people? No, we thought that uh, nobody would be in the engine room at midnight. This is a photograph of the damage done by the bomb. It's a big hole. A much bigger hole than you would have thought. We didn't expect to have a, such a large hole in the hull. There was shrapnel that ripped through the upper decks. Did you calculate that that could have killed people? No, it was not expected to have uh, any other damage. We had never the opportunity to test the real effect on a, a real uh, boat. Fortunately, no one was in the engine room or on the upper decks. Well, if the first bomb had gone off half an hour sooner, we would have lost 20 of us. In 1985, Peter Wilcox was the skipper of Rainbow Warrior. He was in bed asleep when the first bomb exploded. 
we barely had enough time to get everybody off. And not everybody did get off. That's Fernando in the marshals, I suspect. Fernando had been in the mess and had gone to his cabin to get his cameras. And that's when the second bomb went off. And the second bomb trapped him in his cabin and drowned him. The second smaller bomb, supposedly designed to keep the crew off the boat, caused the drowning of photographer Fernando Pereira. The captain of the Rainbow Warrior, Peter Wilcox, says that this was murder, that they knew there were people on board. Yes, I understand his point of view. Uh, but for us, on our side, we think that it was unfortunately an accidental death of an innocent Fernando Pereira. My dad has been murdered. I don't see it as manslaughter. I don't see it as, as um, accidental killing. Ten years ago, Sunday spoke to Fernando Pereira's daughter, Morella. She was just eight when her father died. Sometimes you think, why? I would like to take this opportunity given to me by the TV of New Zealand to express my deepest regrets and apologizes to Miss Marel Pereira and her family uh, for the accidental death of Fernando Pereira. Are you hoping that when Morel sees this, that she will find it in her heart to forgive you? Uh, yes, I would like that she express any forgiveness for, us, for me, for us, for all the team, because we didn't intend to kill anybody during this operation. And the apologies didn't stop there. I want to apologize also to Greenpeace members who were on board of the Rainbow Warrior. And uh, I want to apologize to the people of New Zealand for the unfair uh, clandestine operation conducted on, in an allied, friendly, and peaceful country. Why has it taken 30 years for you to make that apology? 30 years ago, I was a soldier, and after that, I was engaged in many operations, uh, also with the United Nations security, and uh, I had to obey to the orders at that time. But now, I am uh, retired from the active service, and uh, I want to obey to my consciousness. But an apology 30 years on doesn't wash with Peter Wilcox. Soldiers have to have some level of personal responsibility, and obviously they had none. So it's not good enough to say I was acting on orders? No. Oh, it's not. I think that's modern morality. And I think that the men that planted the amount of explosives that they did proved without a doubt that they didn't care how many people they killed. Peter Wilcox says it's not good enough for soldiers to simply say they were taking orders. They need to think through the morality of their actions. Normally, uh, a soldier should not obey an illegal order, but this was order given at the highest level of the government. So, yes, we had to obey the orders. Wasn't this a terrorist act? For us, it was a sabotage operation and uh, no more. Nobody's ever paid the price for Fernando's murder. Nobody. You know, France, France hasn't even apologized for it. They don't care. I think that's despicable. After setting the bombs, Jean-Luc Keister made his getaway in the Zodiac to a rendezvous with a camper van near the Auckland Harbour Bridge. We heard uh, on the radio uh, that uh, somebody was killed and uh, everybody was very, very uh, shocked. When did you realise that morally this was the wrong thing to do? Immediately, when I knew that uh, Fernando Pereira died. Is this something that's plagued you for the past 30 years, been on your conscience? Yes. Many times I'm thinking about these things, because for me, I have an innocent death on my consciousness. A week after the bombing, Jean-Luc Keister and his dive buddy Jean Camas were photographed at a youth hostel in Methven. We stay in the country 10 or 12 days, skiing in the South Island. Then they left New Zealand using false passports. 
How did you feel when you found out that it was the French that were responsible? Oh, so shocked. So completely shocked. I mean, how could we, a bunch of hippies on an old steel trawler, s scare a superpower so much they would set out to murder us? What possibly could we have done? We were speaking truth to power. That was about it. Is that really what scared them so badly? Were there repercussions within the DGSE about this? Was there any debate about what happened? There was no real debriefing at the DGSE headquarters because uh, they were so much occupied with uh, the problems in France and uh, it was a real political fiasco. After the break... It could have been a Watergate, a French Watergate. They could have proved that the president was uh, aware. And Colonel Keister shows me why France's decision to mount an attack in New Zealand was so very wrong. Welcome back to our exclusive investigation. The French have now been implicated in the bombing of the Rainbow Warrior and the death of Fernando Pereira. But they're still denying culpability until a French newspaper reveals dramatic new information. By early September 1985, the French government was under pressure. Aucune organisation no one in my ministry received an order to commit the attack against the Rainbow Warrior. Defence Minister Charles Henoux denied ordering the bombing. The French agents arrested and imprisoned in New Zealand, he claimed, had simply been observing Greenpeace. But then the newspaper Le Monde dropped a bomb of its own, revealing that a third team of French combat divers had planted the explosives. It's a very traditional uh, investigation. Finally, the truth was revealed by the press. Edwy Planel was the police reporter on Le Monde. The Rainbow Warrior was sinked by a third team of French military. It was the missile link. He and his colleagues discovered the combat divers through a process of elimination. And finally, we succeed to identify an officer, a sub-officer, two guys, frogmen, to put the bomb. It was Kister and Kamas. When you ran that story, what was the government reaction? We published our information on the Tuesday, and Charlie Arnu and Amiral Lacoste dismissed on the Friday, three days. The truth is that France organized this bombing and must apologize to New Zealand. The decision to sink the Rainbow Warrior came directly from the top in French politics. 30 years ago this month, the Defence Minister Charles Arnu resigned over his role in the affair. But what about the president, Mitterrand? He lasted in office for a further 10 years, even though funding for the operation came directly from his office. The documents about the financement, the finance, exist. Edwy Planel says after Charlenou resigned, the French government continued a campaign of misinformation to protect the president. They say until many months that there was no third team. Did Laurent Fabius know no, what was going on. No. And yet he was the Prime Minister. Uh, the Prime Minister was not involved. Only the army, the Minister of Defence, the President of the Republic. What? Mitterrand gave the order, in fact. In France, the President is the chief of the armies. So sometimes there are a direct link between the Minister of Defence and the chief of the army. So Laurent Fabius was not aware. He was cut out of the loop. Yes. Yeah. Go back. However, Jean-Luc Keister believes uh, someone no, in the Prime Minister's uh, office leaked his name to the media. I thought that the leak is coming from the high-level, politician level. On this point, I don't agree with uh, uh, Colonel Keister. The reason we knew the name was not the Prime Minister gave us the name. Jean-Luc Keister says being named as the diver who planted the bombs on the Rainbow Warrior cost him dearly. My family was very shocked. My wife was shocked by the fact that somebody died in uh, this operation because before the operation she didn't know where I was. And uh, a few years later I get divorced like many of us. 
Colonel Keister told me he's been involved in many clandestine operations. He's been wounded several times and is a recipient of the Legion d'honneur, France's highest order. However, bombing the Rainbow Warrior was not his finest hour. For us, it was uh, just like to use uh, boxing gloves in order to crush a mosquito, you know? And uh, it was a disproportionate operation, but we had to obey the order and we were soldiers. To emphasize how disappointed he feels about the Auckland bombing, Jean-Luc Keister wanted to take us to this World War II memorial, one of many scattered across northern France. Why is it important to you to bring us here? 7,780 uh, Kiwi soldiers died in France during the two world wars. Here, among the Aussies, Canadians and Brits, lie Kiwi airmen killed while fighting to liberate France. For Jean-Luc Kista, this, more than anything, is a symbol of why Operation Satanic was ill-conceived. And it was wrong, a very wrong decision to conduct such an operation in an allied country and a friendly country. There are the memories of these uh, strong links between France and New Zealand. And we will always remember the sacrifice they have done for our country. President Francois Mitterrand remained close friends with former Defence Minister Charles Lenou long after he sacked him. Both men have since died. Meanwhile, Peter Wilcox is still busy saving the planet in Rainbow Warrior 3. Trying to prevent climate change and overfishing. For him, Jean-Luc Keese's apology changes little. They're the ones that have to live with themselves. They've made their bed. Let them sleep at night. Peter Wilcox said it's probably 30 years too late. Uh, it's never too late for apologize. Well, Jean-Luc Kister asked to meet Fernando Pereira's daughter, Morel, to offer a face-to-face -face apology. Morel declined, saying, the fact that he seems truly remorseful is enough information for my family and I. She said he has to live with himself, knowing what he did and what he was a part of.